Hey guys, uh, looks like there's an attempted coup going on in Russia. Um, it's very fluid, of course. We're going to go into some of the facts, all right? We're going to do this in two ways. We're going to cover the facts that we know of, and I'm going to be very judicious about this because uh, in order to bring you this now, I've got to rely on Western news publications, okay? And you know how that goes, right? So I'm going to bring you the facts. We're going to let uh, a little bit, a uh, few more people jump in, maybe. Uh, it's a Saturday afternoon here in the U.S. Um, so folk might be out enjoying the weather, but there is a coup attempt going on in Russia, okay? The Wagner Group. This is the uh, for all intents and purposes, a group of mercenaries who uh, Vladimir Putin contracted with to go over into Ukraine and uh, uh, supplement the Russian military forces. Apparently, this group is um, very, very effective. You can kind of compare them to, I guess you would say, the closest corollary we have here would have been the BlackRock. Um, was it Black BlackRock? No, not BlackRock. I'm sorry. That's a financial company. Blackwater. Uh, the military contractor, but I think this Wagner group is a lot more autonomous than that. Apparently so. They are marching on, well, they have marched in the direction of Moscow. We're going to get into it right now. All right. So the latest is uh, the head of the Wagner group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has said that his paramilitary group called the Wagner Group is going to stop its forward march to Moscow as Belarus brokers a deal. Okay, so this is the latest. I'm reading this out of the Wall Street Journal right now, guys. Um, so again, let's focus on the facts and then I'm going to get into some of my views. Feel free to share your views. Hit the thumbs up button, guys. Do me that favor, okay? Try to make this uh, video more popular. Why are we covering this? Why are we covering the attempted coup in Russia by the internal military contractor, the Wagner Group? They are Russian based. All right, we're covering this because this actually could, <laughs> this could throw a monkey wrench into the BRICS plan, or the R in BRICS stands for Russia. This could complicate matters with regard to uh, exactly. Uh, how they move forward on their plans to separate from the West in terms of the financial infrastructure. Okay. It could complicate that. Uh, you also got to wonder if this guy, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin was successful. I don't know if you have any um, experience in seeing who this guy is. He doesn't seem like uh, he would be the one to take power. All right. Doesn't seem like that sort of personality, but you never know. Is he just a tool to go in and try to upset the apple cart? Uh, who's behind this really? Okay, why this guy just decide to turn on Russia and Vladimir Putin? Let's just say that. Although he is on record, Yevgeny Prigozhin is on record as saying he's trying to get the uh, military leadership removed. All right. However, come on, who's at the head of the military in Russia, right? Vladimir Putin. All right. So the latest is the Wagner group has said they're going to stop their forward march on Moscow. Belarus has gotten involved brokering a deal. Yevgeny Prigozhin's paramilitary group said his forces will stop their march on Moscow. The Belarusian president, Lukashenko, announces a deal to halt the armed confrontation. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the owner of the Wagner paramilitary group said his forces will stop the march in order to avoid bloodshed. Uh, Lukashenko, president of Belarus, who said he spent most of Saturday negotiating with Prigozhin and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, he said there was an agreement reached, quote, that unleashing a bloodbath on the territory of Russia was unacceptable, end quote. Uh, Prigozhin is Russian. He is from Russia. And I guess um, he's smart enough to understand that if he had to fight his own countrymen, he stands to lose popularity very, very quickly. Okay. 
the war's coming home. The deal offered to Prigozhin is, quote, absolutely advantageous and acceptable, unquote, and will involve unspecified security guarantees for Wagner, he added. There were no further details. These security uh, guarantees, come on, guys, we're all adults here. We won't kill you. All right. Uh, we, we will allow you to maybe uh, go elsewhere uh, in the country. OK, or maybe make your way out of the country. But Vladimir Putin has a long history of tracking down his opponents. And, um, you know, waiter, there's uh, some plutonium in my soup kind of thing. OK, he's he's done that kind. He's a fan of poison. We all know that it's well documented. Wagner troops seized the southern Russian city of Rostov on Saturday morning and advanced toward Moscow through the day. Now, look, let's stop right there. When they're talking about seizing a city, I'm sure they seized a part of a city. But if you think about any American city of note, uh, even down to a small one like Baltimore, have you really seized the entire city or do you just have downtown? OK, uh, that's unclear. The other thing is uh, they're saying he's marching. He's advancing toward Moscow, but it's not uh, it's not a short trip. OK. Uh, let me show it to you on the map here. Give me a second. Okay. So you see that map? Uh, that represents about 1,100 kilometers, that red line. Okay. With Rostov being at the bottom, Moscow being at the top. So that's not a short trip at all. Okay. Uh, it takes about 12 hours by car. So when you got armored columns and you know, supplies to move is going to take longer than that. So um, if you're reading these reports or you maybe you watch the news, I don't. But maybe if you're watching it and they're making it seem like that this is just down the road, it's not. Wagner, um, they got they got Rostov on Saturday. They faced limited resistance along the way, even after Putin ordered his military to put down what he described as a treasonous mutiny. Sure, you faced uh, limited resistance because well, who's going to fight you? The townspeople. All right. And then a military has to be mobilized to go and confront you. A lot of the military is in Ukraine. Uh, the crisis unfolding in Russia represented the most serious challenge to Putin's 23 year rule. All right, guys, look, from an economic standpoint, again, I want to stress this definitely is advantage Western financial infrastructure, because the case could be made, look, we've got a lot of political instability within Russia, one of the leading components of the BRICS nation. We've been doing uh, BRICS, uh, not nation, but the BRICS organization. We've been doing a lot of reporting on how BRICS is trying to expand itself. There are 20 applicants out there, other countries trying to get into the organization. There has been talk of BRICS possibly putting together a uh, of the dollar alternative, many people think it will be backed by commodities like gold and oil, among other things, because a lot of the countries that are trying to join this alliance are resource rich countries. OK, Russia is too. Russia has oil. All right. Uh, so this is a direct threat. It's the only one that he's faced so far, but this is not unique for that part of the world. We're going to get into that a little bit in a moment. Uh, Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner group, has a history of going back on his promises. And it wasn't yet clear whether Wagner's uprising was over and what political price Putin had agreed to pay. That's very important. What did Putin give up? And if he did concede something, then that might be a, a leading indicator of what Putin's position is in Russia going forward. Okay. Cause you don't have to give up anything if you don't think that your position is weak, but, or weekend. All right. But, um, we'll find out. They're not saying that, uh, the details of any concessions. Prigozhin's key demand for the past several months was the removal of the minister of defense, Sergei, uh, Sergei Shigoy. And the chief of the general staff, General Valery Gerizimov, whom he blamed, Prigozhin blamed, for mismanaging the war in Ukraine. But look, 
Um, I know their system is not mirroring ours, but the, the way we would kind of demand the removal of a secretary of defense would not include marching on Washington with military troops, okay? Because this is very serious. Quote, understanding all the responsibility that Russian blood may be spilled by one of the sides, turned around our columns and are returning to the field camps, according to plan. Uh, this, this is what Prigozhin said. Columns of Wagner tanks, artillery, and personnel carriers were spotted crossing the Veronas and, uh, I'm going to butcher this, Leptsik regions coming to within 200 miles of the Russian capital by Saturday afternoon. Okay, so they do have some forces that are closer to Moscow than others. Uh, there were no major attempts to stop them on the M4 highway by Russian ground forces, though the column was occasionally attacked by a Russian combat aircraft. Imagine driving down 95 and you see uh, United States military airplanes attacking a column of uh, folk that are, you know, driving their way toward D.C. Imrod Lexis says, I guarantee you that BRICS is going to use Bitcoin as a small percentage in that basket of items they'll use to back the currency they're developing. I would not doubt that at all. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And uh, what is it? Um, which country is it? El Salvador. OK, that has really gone full bore with linking their economy to Bitcoin. So I think you may, uh, I do agree with that, that a percentage of it, okay, we'll probably see that. All right. Um, video footage showed the main Verona's fuel depot ablaze after an airstrike, the wreckage of several helicopters and one warplane being shot out of the sky. Fighter bomber, a Russian military a aviation telegram channel, that is well connected with the Russian Air Force, said that Wagner Saturday downed six Russian helicopters, including a KA-50 and an IL-18 or IL-22 Airborne Command Center plane. Remember, these guys from Wagner are military trained, okay? They are, um, it, I, I would imagine that if you've gone from the government forces of the military and you pushed it up a notch to a private commercialized military, paramilitary group, these are going to be a cut above just your average Russian soldier, okay, in terms of tactics, especially. So it, no one should be surprised. They've got the equipment, they've got the skill, the experience. No one should be surprised that they're able to do these things. Sporadic shooting was heard in Rostov, <clears throat> home to the main military headquarters for southern Russia, as troops loyal to Chechen strongman Ramzan Katarov were seen driving in a long column toward the city. So here come the Chechens. Will they support Putin or will they uh, side with um, Prigozhin? Uh, Prigozhin? And that brings me to another question. Uh, is Prigozhin just stalling for time? with regard to this um, Belarusian, you know, truce or whatever you want to call it. No immediate word on casualties. The crisis unfolding in Russia represents the most serious challenge to Putin in 23 years. Okay, we already said that. Puts a strain on Russian society. Absolutely. You got unrest at home now, military unrest, and you got a war being fought in another country. Okay, this kind of thing that shakes the confidence. And I think Vladimir Putin is strong enough, uh, smart enough rather to know that if the Wagner insurrection is not put down swiftly, the strife could significantly undermine Russia's frontline troops in Ukraine, just as Kiev carries out a Western backed defenses to reclaim lands. OK, the swift progress of Wagner's forces from Rostov suggested that many parts of the Russian security establishment were reluctant to confront them, at least for now. Ah, oh, man, it uh, looks like uh, Vladimir Putin kind of miscalculated on one major thing. When you're paying people to do a job and you're giving them an outsized uh, level of power, okay, and their system does not have the checks and balances that, you know, uh, UK or uh, America or even a China, okay, might have. Uh, you create somebody potentially like Prigozhin who's able to challenge you, okay? He's got 
again, the equipment to do it. He's got the personnel. He's got the expertise. Uh, that's a big problem. And the other thing is when you're paying these guys to do this, you're opening yourself up for another organization to come in and possibly pay more. Look, just speculating here, but uh, I know an organization, I'm not going to say who they are. I'll give you their initial CIA, who they got deep pockets and uh, they might come at a mercenary like Prigozhin and say, hey, we could pay you more. OK, we could do this for you. We could do that for you. We could make you a very wealthy man if you just turn those tanks around and head in the other direction and uh, do us this solid, okay? You know, the United States of America loves those two words, regime change. Many members of the SS FSB, intelligence service, and Russian military intelligence support Prigozhin because they have grown disillusioned by graft within the Russian army and by its failure to achieve success in Ukraine, said Gleb Arasov, a former Russian Air Force officer. Uh, quote, they are against corruption and criminality, blah, blah, blah. Now we're now, and I'm, again, I'm reading this from the Wall Street Journal. So we're not going, this is a Western news uh, outlet, and they're subtly going in the direction of propaganda now, because I know they're not going to bring up anyone that opposes this and says, hey, you know, we, uh, any rank and file folk, of course, they'll have Putin's administration coming out in support. But I want to be careful here, okay? Because this literally, the fact that he agreed to this uh, deal by Lashenko over in Belarus, I was putting together a live stream and time I hit start broadcast, this popped up. It's like brand new. I was going to talk about another aspect of this, but this popped up. So since it was fresh, I said, let's go ahead and get in front of it. But I don't want to fall into the trap of the Western media or any media for that matter and go with the freshest story, which is not going to have the most accurate facts and also um, a situation where I don't want to be I'm not going to be the parrot of the uh, of anybody's administration. OK, so I got to be careful with that. Now, let's do this real quick. This type of thing. We've seen it happen in Russia before, Go all the way back to Tsar Nicholas, okay? And uh, the issues that he had with military entanglements and, you know, losing territory and the people lost confidence and it, it gave a window to some uh, individuals who wanted to establish a different type of government and take then Russia to uh, what became the Soviet Union. Uh, this was in the late, I think it was uh, 1917 that uh, he was deposed. And look, I don't know how much you know about this aspect of Russian history, but this turned really ugly because not only was Tsar Nicholas deposed, but him and his entire family were later executed, right? And when I say his entire family, I'm talking about his wife. Uh, he had a hemophiliac son, young boy, uh, and several daughters. And uh, the revolutionaries came in and they shot them all. Okay. Uh, actually, that's not right. They shot Nicholas. They shot the wife and then they bayoneted the children. Okay. It was brutal. All right. So that's one aspect or one incident where in recent history, I'm not going back to Peter the Great or Ivan the Terrible and, and not going back that far. But at least in the last century or just, just over the last century, we've seen that. And then we also saw uh, what happened with regard to um, Gorbachev and when the Soviet Union fell. So entering the Soviet Union, we had, you know, this type of revolutionary activity and then uh, going out of it, getting back to Russia. They, okay, we're done with communism. It was, you know, an ugly chapter. It didn't really work well. Let's get out of it. So you had the 1991 coup attempt, okay, uh, in when they tried Gorbachev, the hardline communists tried to oust Gorbachev, didn't work, but that happened in August. And then later in that same year in October, uh, Gorbachev stepped down, okay? And then that gave, uh, what's his name, Boris Yeltsin, the opportunity to slide on in. 
And after Boris Yeltsin, it was Putin. And it's been Putin uh, ever since. Even when Putin said, OK, I'm going to I'm going to do this thing with uh, Vladimir Medvedev where we switch places. I'm going to step down and become the prime minister. And then Medvedev is going to become the president. And then we're going to just flip it. So there was a period in there where Putin was not president. He was he was president, guys. But the title changed. All right. So um, code for bad salts saying, oh, no. What's going on there? Um, so I just wanted to bring you that. We'll continue to watch that because, again, we do a lot of reporting on what's going on with the BRICS nations as they lose faith in the U.S. dollar. Now, it's possible that, you know, this could be an elaborate operation to say, hey, look, we need to wrap this up because Joe Biden's going into an election year. And this thing is turning into a real problem from the standpoint of the United States of America continually giving Ukraine money and equipment. And more and more American people, even people that supported this thing, which I never did, but people that supported this, this thing are getting fed up. OK, uh, so maybe they want to end it. And maybe this is kind of a last ditch attempt to try and do that, right, to kind of have Putin going in a couple of different directions, trying to protect his own power. Uh, and this could lead to him saying, look, OK, we're going to draw down in Ukraine and just come on back. I think that we hurt him ultimately. Um, but that's speculation. We will wait to see what the real deal is as the days progress. We'll be very careful about taking a look at alternative sources from, you know, as close to the region as we can get so that we don't come on here and just spout, you know, propaganda. Imrod Lexus, I wonder if this is all a ploy to launch a massive strike or a tactical nuke against Ukraine and blame it on the rogue fighter or something along those lines. These days, Imrod Lexus, I would not put anything past any of them. OK, um, I believe that when they said that uh, Bashar Assad had launched a chemical weapons attack on his own people, I never believed that he did that. OK, and I'm no Bashar Assad fan. OK, um, but I never believed that he did that. Uh, so there is a kind of a false flag thing that has been done and documented, and we know about it. Uh, and Imran Lexus goes on to say, that way Putin can say, I didn't launch it and try to avoid responsibility. He could. Okay. Or you could have this. Try this on for size. If this guy, um, not Lukashenko, but the head of the Wagner group, uh, Prigozhin, let's say he uh, he doesn't seem like the type that is ready for political leadership. Seems good at what he does, which is being a military tactician. Um, but there is a scenario, no matter how much of a long shot it is, where uh, he does depose Putin. Who takes over after that? Is it him? Because he seems to look at the world through a military lens. And I mean, would he continue the war? Because on the assignments that they've given, the Wagner group, they've been very successful. Even Western media admits to that. All right. So how far would he take it? Uh, would, would he be more apt to show less restraint than Putin has on certain type of weaponry? OK. Um, uh, as far as Bashar Assad, Imrod Lexus says, yeah, he didn't do it. They just wanted Syria to bow and accept the Fed Bank. Absolutely. Look what they did to Gaddafi when he started talking about uh a Pan-African currency backed by gold. All right. Um, Saddam had some comments of a similar. And again, I got to stress, I'm not saying these people were good guys at all. I'm just pointing out that there were instances where they said certain things and then they ended up had, having certain fates. Uh, calendar page, I watch Inside Russia, who lived and worked, uh, lived and worked in the U.S., so he has some of our so he has some of our perspective, but left Russia right before the conscription. OK, OK. Yeah, because you're right. They did start conscripting people into the military um, as this thing went on. It's good to have a native speaker's insight. Absolutely, because we're missing a lot in translation to begin with. And then 
Look, uh, I'm not saying that RT or Russia Today or any of those outlets are, um, you know, any less propagandistic, if that's a word, than our news organizations. But listen, I do think it's important to at least see what they're saying, because I want to understand what they are trying to convince their people of. I think that's an important perspective and trying to parse out exactly what's going on. Kind of like with China. Okay. People say, oh, don't read. Um, it's a paper I read from China. And I know it's a, it's a, a Beijing mouthpiece, but I want to see what they're feeding their people, how they want their people to view the world. Yeah, uh, KG, how you doing? Yeah, we. Um, I just finished mentioning that. We started this um, live stream with the intent of just talking about the attempted coup. But just as I started it, that news came over that Prigozhin had ordered his troops back, that uh, Lukashenko over in Belarus had got... Prigozhin and Putin on the phone and they came up with some sort of agreement. Yes, that's what that's exactly. Uh, yep. Yep. It's fast moving situation, KG. Absolutely. So, guys, uh, like I said, uh, I want to I want to read this from calendar page. Hold on. Uh, I also watch Vlad Vexler, a Russian immigrant professor in the UK. Man, I love to hear the intellect, firsthand knowledge of Russia and its history and why. S-H-I-T <laughs> over there looks like it does. I, um, you can see the bookshelf. That bookshelf behind me is, you should see this office I'm sitting in. I've got books all over the floor and I've read extensively about Peter the Great, uh, Catherine, um, Ivan. All right. Uh, I like the world's history. Uh, I've always talked to you guys. I've talked to you on several occasions about uh, Mao. Okay, that book that I have. In fact, let me, uh, because somebody asked me to give them the authors. All right, this book, Mao, okay. It's written by uh, Zhang Chang and John Halliday. When you go through the Cultural Revolution part of this, you're going to see so many similarities with modern day America and a lot of these other Western countries. It's just crazy. All right, guys. So that's all we have for now. Uh, oh no, KG, you're fine. You're fine. Um, that that's no problem. Uh, it's a like I said, it's a fast moving situation. So I uh, thank you for your contribution. All right, everyone. Well, enjoy your Saturday. If something else happens, we'll be with it. Okay. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks for supporting the channel. Hit like on your way out, and I will talk to you soon.